Hey, Bon Beanie, everybody, and welcome to part one of this dive from the Dominican Republic. This is a dive that I did in May of 2018 on board the Carnival Vista. Well, I didn't dive on board the Carnival It's Anyway, I was, yeah, La Romana was the port, and um, yeah, this is a two-tank dive, so this is going to be another four-part series. Thank you guys if you've been watching my snorkeling and dive videos if you are enjoying these i'm just going to say it up front please hit that thumbs up and even more importantly comment below so that i know that you are enjoying them and that'll encourage me to make more so if you're not enjoying them i don't know why you're actually watching but anyway thank you for watching so uh th look i promised the uncut version and so right here you see me kind of wrestling around with my gear i had the i turned the camera on right when I hit the water, but uh, I was, you know, I had to I had to let the air out of my BC vest, my buoyancy compensator vest, so that I could get my body down below, and then you got to regulate that so that you kind of hover. That's one of the things about scuba diving. Now, I did this dive with my buddy Charlie. That's not him in the hood. That is the local guy who apparently thought it was cold in this water. It was not cold in the water, but... You know whatever some people are less tolerant than others of different temperatures so you got to do what makes you comfortable this is going to be a little different than that snorkeling video oh there's a trumpet fish that just went by did you see that already we got some cool stuff Th there it is trumpet fish usually they swim vertically this one's swimming horizontally you know wants to be different i i can respect that but uh, this is going to be different than the snorkeling videos because it is a diving video, which means that I'm underwater the whole time and able to kind of take a little bit more time to look at animals if they are deeper, which makes for a different experience. Now, some people might wonder, Matt, what do you like more? Do you prefer diving or snorkeling? And, and really, I like them both for different reasons. I would not want to only snorkel. I would not want to only dive you know I, I like some days I like to dive some days I like to snorkel the advantage of diving is that you get to take your time you get to spend more time at, from a fisheye view if you will uh, but at the same time I really enjoy swimming down holding my breath hanging out for a minute without all that heavy gear you know I usually get to spend more time if I'm snorkeling now the the videos I released before this, well, that wasn't the case because I was on a snorkeling boat. And so when you're on a boat, you're limited to when they let you in the water and when they want you out of the water. But in a lot of cases, I, I can snorkel as long as I'm at a location if it's from the shore. And that could be several hours rather than an hour or an hour and a half in total. There is a, uh, there is a fish right there. I talked about him in the last video. They are called blue tang. I almost forgot one of the most common fish. They are called blue tang, and you will see a lot of those. I don't know if you notice that little white spot right in front of the fish's tail fin, caudal fin, for you that want the scientific, more scientifically accurate common name of that fin is the caudal fin. So this is our dive master who is kind of leading us on this tour. If you do a scuba diving excursion, most of them I find the way that they work is that they will have somebody that leads you on this sort of tour. They tell you, hey, let me know when you get to this amount of air in your tank and all that kind of stuff. So it's kind of cool to do it this way because um, you are going with somebody that knows the area. They can take you to all the cool spots. Sometimes they know where there, there's a sergeant major. Sometimes they know where there's all the cool stuff hangs out. There might be a spot where like more eels hang out and that kind of thing. The, the disadvantage is sometimes I just want to hang out in one area and just watch the fish. There's a creole wrasse right there, some more. And um, you kind of got to keep on moving on. There's a little smooth puffer down there and there's more creole wrasse right there. Sometimes it's cool just to hang out in one location for... A while but you know like I said everything has its ups and downs I, I enjoy both experiences uh, he's asking if everybody is okay and uh, so you use a lot of hand signals when scuba diving and okay is one of the main ones make sure everybody is all right there are the other people that were diving there's Charlie coming in hot <laughs> 
not really. That would be bad if he was. Uh, but yeah, and this is this is a wall, so kind of like the wall in Grand Turk. There you can see my pressure and depth gauge, or pressure depth gauge and air pressure gauge, I should say. Um, this is another wall. This one, I don't believe, is as deep of a drop off, but it's still way deeper than you're going to go scuba diving. So it's kind of an abyss that it drops to. Right here, it's a little bit more gradual. But then as you go down a little bit further, that wall is pretty straight up and down. So kind of cool. The the challenge of diving on a wall is that because you're on the horizontal side of a, of a mountain of sea life or coral, I should say, um, you don't necessarily know your depth very easily. You got to keep an eye on your depth gauge. You know, you don't want to accidentally drift down. You may not know if you drift down 15, 20 feet or up 15, 20 feet. Whereas if you're just diving on a regular coral reef that's below you, obviously, you know, you can't go deeper than the bottom. But here you're, it, you know, imagine, imagine that you're on the side of a cliff flying. That's kind of what this is like, or a steep hill in this case. But um, yeah, presents a little bit more of a challenge, but not, it's not hard, you know. You just got to remember to look at your gauges. You should be looking at your gauges anyway. And you kind of get an idea too from the, just the way the colors change and uh, even even the type of, of living things that you see can change a little bit. You see a little, these little fish down here, uh, they're kind of purpley blue and yellow. Those are fairy basslets. We saw some of those in the snorkeling video from Grand Turk, but maybe saw them a little bit better over here. This is plate coral here. I'm not super knowledgeable about different species of coral. I know some of the general ones, but um, you know, I'd have to I'd have to look up a lot of these, and um, I so I don't want to spend too much focus on that. If you're interested in that, then I would recommend getting a good guidebook on coral. The one that I would recommend is the same one that I use for fish, which is basically it's a whoa sorry hit the microphone there, which is basically reef fish identification, but it's coral identification, Florida, Caribbean, and Bahamas. It's by Paul Human and Ned Deloach. It's not 100% comprehensive because there's so many different species of coral, but it does the job. Now you see what our, our dive master here has found is a lionfish. This is one of the largest lionfish I've ever seen. Now you don't want to touch these fish because those spines on the top of their body, there are 11 dorsal spines and they do contain a venomous coating that is there for defense. So it'll cause excruciating pain if they stick one of those into your hand. You got to be careful with them. Unfortunately, these fish, because they're so beautiful, they're popular in the pet trade and unfortunately they have been introduced, probably that's how they got here, they've been introduced into this part of the world. They're from the Pacific, I think, Indo-Pacific area. And now they are a nuisance because there aren't animals that are adapted to eat them in this part of the world, and they eat a lot. They have a big mouth that opens up. It's not their fault, you know, but, uh, but if you do like eating seafood and you want to be very responsible, eat some lionfish from anywhere in the Atlantic or the Caribbean or the Gulf of Mexico. You'll be helping out. Because it, it just, whenever you get a species like that, that is not from that area, it can easily throw the balance off of that ecosystem. Sometimes they don't, it depends on the species, but more often than not, it's going to shake things up. And, uh, you know, that, that happens naturally in some instances, but in the case of the lionfish, it's a human caused situation and it could, uh, it would eventually balance out again, but, um, maybe not in a way that is preferable <laughs> to what what it would be if it just followed a natural flow of time without human interference. So sometimes when we in interrupt things in nature, we can change them dramatically and uh, in ways that maybe wouldn't have occurred. And sometimes that can be really bad for us as well <laughs> as the animals that live there. So think about the commercial fishing industry and how important it is that we have seafood for people to eat. Uh, lionfish, 
you know, they can they can disrupt that. So we're not just talking about saving fish for the sake of saving fish, although I think that's a valid reason. We're also talking about saving fish for economical reasons, for uh, making sure that there's enough food in, in certain parts of the world, th things like that. So that's my little conservation soapbox for this video. <laughs> I think it's the last one. We'll see. But yeah, so this is this is pretty cool though. I, I've dove on the wall in Grand Turk. I've dove on this wall. Um, it's an interesting type of dive, a little unique to other dives. And you, what you, what I miss from these experiences though is that you may notice there's not a lot of fish on this reef system, and and I've I've noticed that to be pretty consistent on the other wall dives I've done. Now I don't know if there are walls that are loaded with fish, but when you get up to where this coral reef levels off and then the next site there was an area we where we put into the water where it leveled off and it actually it might be this one and it was just loaded with with fish but um yeah when you get to the wall it just changes and um at least in this instance and in grand turk my experience has been that you don't have as many fish species now it's still cool there's still a lot of other living things here you just don't actually have the fish diversity. But, you know, I mean, take a close look at all of these little structures here. The, the green that you see in front of you kind of growing out that looks like a plant. Well, basically it is. That's algae that's growing. And then, of course, you have all the corals. We talked about plate corals. There's a bunch of different coral species here. There are sponges, lots of sponges. And then there are these feathery looking things that you'll see here in just a second. We're going to come up on them. And those are actually a type of animal called a hydroid. They're related, there they are. They're related to things like um, sea anemones and coral and jellies. There's a sponge. And they do give you a mild sting. So another reason not to, not to touch anything. It's easy to brush against one of those with your knee. And if you have sensitive skin, you'll get a sting. There's a little smooth puffer fish, a couple of them down there. There is a four eye butterfly fish right there. Pretty neat fish. That's what I was talking about, too, in one of these videos. I don't remember if it was this one. But, um, you know, identifying fish, what you want to do is you want to look for groups of fish. Learn those first. You know, I knew that's a, what a, was a butterfly fish, and then you can kind of go from there. There was a mahogany snapper that just swam down below. You can tell them by their snapper shape, and then they have sort of a white or silverish body with a little bit of red around their tail. So many living things living together. It's like a city. And now you can kind of see up the wall. So that's what I mean by it can be a little misleading. If that was misleading, you're like, oh, I didn't realize you had gone that far down the wall. Well, you know, I might not have either. So <laughs> I want to say at this point, we might have been sitting at about 80, 85 feet. I can't remember for sure. It might have been closer to 60. Uh, I don't know if I got the depth gauge on film at all but somewhere in that range is, is where I believe we were I might be getting the 80 foot confused with the Grand Turk I think we I think we hit around 80 feet when you do that in scuba diving you have to when you go up you can't just when your dives over you can't just surface or you could get some problems so you have to do a safety stop where you stop at a, a shallower depth and you just sit there and let the the nitrogen even out in your body a little bit Otherwise, you can get something called the bends, which a lot of people have heard of, which is an excruciatingly painful thing that can be very dangerous. Scuba diving is pretty safe, but those are the kind of things you need to know. You can't, you can't swim up super fast, or you could cause a, a lung embolism, and you've got to take a safety stop. You know, if you're, if you're down at this depth, this 60 to 80 foot range, that's when you're going to really need to know those safety rules. But, um, but don't let that scare you off, because... Those are really simple rules to follow. It's like saying, you know, it's safe to cross the street, but you better know that you got to look both ways and wait till traffic's not going. If you didn't, then you could get yourself into some serious trouble. I believe those were bicolor damsels. Well, they were definitely damsels that were two colors, but I believe that's what they're called, is bicolor damsels right there. Another little smooth puffer fish. 
and that's about full size, I believe, on that species. So there are a lot of different... Sometimes people ask me, you know, what's the difference between like a porcupine fish and a puffer fish? And a, there's one called a burr fish. And they're all related fish. They could all sort of be grouped into a group of fish called puffers. It's just that the porcupine fish has spikes, so does the burr fish. And the smooth puffer is, well, it's smooth. <laughs> so no spikes. So there, and there's a lot of different types of puffer fish. There's another bicolor damsel and another smooth puffer. Lots of smooth puffers on this reef and bicolor damselfish. There's another one swimming down there, a little bicolor damselfish. Now those are all one of the color phases of that species of puffer, or I'm sorry, of damselfish. And you see that orange thing right there? So typically when you see orange or, or a bright yellow, a lot of times that's going to be a sponge. Not always. Uh, coral are usually going to be, and I'm speaking of the Caribbean specifically here because it's different in the Pacific, but uh, corals are going to typically be sort of greens and blues and uh, maybe yellows as well, but they're not usually as, as brightly colored. Browns, a lot of corals are browns, but again, you know, that's speaking very generally. There are certain ex certainly exceptions to those rules. There are some blue chromis which is a type of small blue-colored damselfish right there. Cute little things. So much life here. Looked like a parrot maybe that went over the top of that. I couldn't quite catch the species on it. Maybe we'll see it again. Oh, look, more smooth puffer fishes. Well, look. If, if anything, you're going to know what smooth pufferfish look like from watching this video, because there are a lot. There are a whole lot. Now, you can really kind of see with this coral, too, this plate coral. See all those little polyps? That's what coral is, typically. It's a bunch of little polyps, little individual animals living together as one larger animal. They're a colonial species, and uh, pretty, pretty cool in that regard. And they build a limestone skeleton, and they grow on top of it, and they just... One of the ways they reproduce is to just keep cloning on top of that and building that individual chunk of coral. So it might that's when you hear coral growing that grows really slowly. And um, you can see that the living part is this brown color and then the kind of white color is, uh, is where it's dead. I believe that purple was a sponge. That looks like a sponge of some sort to me as well. So yeah. Lots of different things to look at. And take your time. There's a lot of things sometimes hiding in there. There's some little fry of some sort back there. But I think at this point I am going to wrap up part one of this dive in the Dominican Republic. Thank you guys for watching. Again, please let me know in the comments if you are enjoying these, if you have any questions. You want something identified that I didn't identify and uh, give it a thumbs up if you are enjoying it. There's a yellowhead wrasse right there. Subscribe to the channel and hit that bell so you're notified when a new Cruise Geeks episode comes out. And stay tuned for part two of this first dive in the Dominican Republic. Until then, have a fantastic day.